Hi, everybody. All right, today I'm going to uh, share a few ways to improve accessibility and therefore usability of the websites we're creating for people. Now, since my lightning talk is only 10 minutes, I'm going to talk pretty fast. And while this talk is aimed at designers, I hope that all of you will get some value from it. But let's dive right into it. Let's get into number one. Uh, is it clickering? All right, choosing colors. You probably already know about the web, you know, the minimum contrast, uh, color contrast guidelines that you need to meet to meet the accessibility guidelines, the ratios, I mean. But there's more to it than that. First of all, a higher contrast ratio helps everyone distinguish elements on the page. So especially, this, this is really especially helpful outdoors when there's a lot of glare or when you're using a projector in a bright conference room, for example. And it's quite possible the brand guide you're working on doesn't provide you with the colors you need to, to achieve these desired contrast ratios. So you might need to expand those guidelines and create new tints and add them to the guidelines. But contrast ratio alone doesn't address some issues related to color blindness. And almost 5% of people on this planet have some form of color blindness. And that affects how they perceive colors. So it's a good idea to use a simulator to determine how your color choices are going to affect their experience. Which brings us to link styles, where color is also a consideration, of course. When it comes to links, there's more to it than just the contrast ratio. Links must be visually distinguished by some other means in addition to color. I still see websites where it's just like an orange piece of text. Some people will not see that. They can be underlined, obviously, or they can be bold or italic. The key thing is they need to look like links. If the link goes to another site or opens in another window, let the user know so they don't get confused or lost when they try to go back. Technically, you don't need to specify hover, visited, and active states uh, uh, or styles, but it is a nice touch and it does help people. These options have been around forever and they exist for reasons, so why not use them? And if you do decide to come up with a custom fancy style for the focus state, I warn you, make sure that you think about how it will apply to every single clickable element on your site. You might even have to come up with more than one style, depending on your color scheme and uh, how your components and like buttons and cards are styled, so that people don't get lost when they're tabbing through the links on your site. And that brings us to tab order. Consider how people will navigate your page, including menus and web forms, using a keyboard. This is something a lot of designers and developers neglect to do, unfortunately, but it's really important to think it through. Designers can help developers by providing annotations in their design files for the dev handoff, for example. Uh, the Figma community does provide some great resources and free tools, you, like templates you can use, or you can come up with a simple format yourself. It doesn't have to be fancy. And make sure you think through your how your drop-down menus work, please, uh, because they can be a real pain for keyboard users, especially if you have a mega menu with 20 plus links and buttons to go through uh, that they would have to tab through individually just to get to the next drop-down. Okay, similarly on the topic of wayfinding navigation, breadcrumbs and active menu links. Uh, these can be really, really helpful for all users especially on deeper pages. Now, you never know how someone might have landed on that page four or five levels deep into your site. And these UI elements can quickly help them get oriented. You don't really need breadcrumbs on the home page or the top level landing pages, but any deeper than that, and they become really useful as a way to navigate back up through your site. And active menu links can also be very helpful uh, when you, as soon as you click down, basically one level down from the home page. Okay, semantic structure. Okay, this is maybe for the more technical people in the room. Uh, it's still important, I think, for designers to be aware of the underlying structure of the pages they're designing. First, don't assign heading levels based on the style. Heading levels imply a hierarchical relevance, and H2 relates to the preceding H1, and H3 relates to the preceding H2. If you mix and match heading style levels, just because you want a bigger or, sm or smaller font size, you're potentially going to confuse somebody who's accessing your site with a screen reader. You can have more than one size and styles for headings, okay? Just for different use cases, that's okay. But please, don't mess up the order. It's also helpful to know that HTML templates have regions, and screen readers can use these to navigate the page. 
And so it's a good idea to be familiar with how that works. And when you're collaborating with developers, uh, you are clear about whether something is in the header or the body or the footer, for example. And finally, you're probably familiar with ordered and unordered lists, but did you know about description lists? Uh, these are generally underutilized, honestly, but they can be helpful for things like glossaries and metadata. Um, but anecdotally, they don't really work well for FAQs. You're better off using a details element for that. Okay, some more uh, structured stuff, tables. Now, when designing with tables, it's really key to include a caption that describes what the table contains for screen reader users. Uh, the description doesn't have to be visible technically, but it doesn't hurt to have it exposed for everyone. And similarly, each column and possibly each row, depending on your, your data, um, should have a heading, an actual TH heading <laughs> tag to make it clear what the data is. Uh, most designers just assume that if they make the first row or column bold or give it a colored background that they're done and it's taken care of. But actually, there, there's a special tag for this. And if you do have a large table with lots of rows and columns, use striping. It really helps everyone navigate the data. And I know it's 2023, but please, um, if you don't know yet, 99% of the time, tables should only be used for data, not for layout. Okay, charts and infographics. Whenever possible, use SVGs, for, especially for complex graphics. It's, it's, unless it's super complex, like a city map, Trust me, you don't want to use an SVG for that. You'll probably want to use a PNG for the base layer. You can have the SVG elements on top. But if you need to describe a complex chart or an infographic, don't try to stuff a paragraph of text in the alt tag. Uh, either describe it using inline text above or below, or use a table, or use both. It helps everyone. The key is that you provide a non-graphical alternative that conveys essentially the same content in a way that can be interpreted by someone using assistive technology. Okay, forms and documents. Uh, first, if at all possible, avoid using PDFs or docs if you can make a web page instead. I don't need to preach to the crier here probably. But when designing forms, ensure it's clear what each field is for before and after they put the cursor in it. Don't make it disappear, please. Uh, validation error messaging should be helpful and instructive and high contrast color um, and, and some other kind of visual indication is really helpful to indicate when in, any entries that need to be fixed. Ideally, put all of your form fields on a single page. Uh, that way users can refer back to previous answers and if that, that's not possible, at very least provide progress indicators so people can see where they are in the process. And if you do need to provide PDFs or docs, sometimes they're needed, uh, ensure they're accessible. Now this is often overlooked, uh, but it's possibly, uh, and possibly best suited to a designer to take care of this because they might actually have a copy of Acrobat Pro and know how to use it and know how to include alt text on images in Google Docs. Ah, carousels. First, do you really need one? Really? Okay, there are a couple cases where you might warrant a, a carousel. So if you must, please provide controls so, and visual indicators. Uh, and please, don't autoplay them. Just don't, I'm begging you. And on that note, we have a new tool at our disposal. It's called Reduced Motion Support. This is a little bit more recent, but very helpful thing you can do for people with motion sensitivity, ADHD, or any kind of vestibular disorder. All the browsers now support this as an accessibility feature, or a preference setting, rather. And it's our duty to support it in our websites. If we're animating things, or using parallax effects, or God forbid, animating any carousels. In general, when it comes to motion, less is more. Uh, but if you do want to have fancy animations or scroll effects, that's fine. But please, provide a toggle so people can disable them. And similar to the animated carousel thing, please let users initiate and control any videos or animations. Just because you think it's cool or the boss does, doesn't mean that everyone feels that way. It may actually make them nauseous. And that's not what you want, right? Okay, do we have time for one more? I'm gonna do it. You guessed it, dark mode. Yeah, it's taken over these days. Uh, not just because it's cool, it's actually a pretty great feature for a number of reasons, and it can be helpful for accessibility as well. Uh, most browsers and operating systems now support this preference, so go forth and design a dark mode. 
your users will love it. All right, that's all I've got for today. Thank you. Please hit me up after the conference with any questions or feedback. You can also find me at any of the networks below uh, or reach out to me through our company website, academy.com. And finally, this presentation would not have been possible without the help I got from my colleague, Patricia Rodriguez, and all the amazing photographers who shared their work on Unsplash.com. Thanks again for having me.